God bless you. Welcome you. Please join us. And just give us a little moment of your time. Let's fellowship in the presence of the Lord at this hour. This is the Chapel of Grace, University of Medugri, Nigeria. We want to share from the Word of God, from John chapter 15, verse 5, that says, For without me you can do nothing. Where Jesus said, For without me you can do nothing. In John chapter 15, verse 5. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment of exhortation and meditation in your word. Thank you for the blessing of the first day of the week. Thank you for the blessing of life. Thank you for the blessing of necessities of life. Thank you for the health you have granted us. Thank you for protecting us, O oh Lord, from all the perils and all the dangers of these perilous times. Thank you for seeing us through the pandemic and preserving us against all odds. Thank you for you are not confused, you are not deceived, you know everything, but humanity, we are still looking for a way out, some deceiving, others being deceived, some committed, others not committed, but Lord, in all things, you will see us through, in the government of every nation, in the life and the health of every human being on the face of the earth, Father, in the economics and the needs of your children, Father, we have confidence that you will see us through. Lord, that you will overrule and that this condition that has been brought upon the world by the pandemic of this coronavirus, Lord, by the outstretched arm of the mighty God, corona will be sent into a corner and your people shall be set free. The nations of the world shall bless your name and those that knew you not, they shall understand that the Lord, he is God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are welcome again as we share from the word of God. I will read John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus said there, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him. The same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. But I want you to remember he's talking about the vine. And he's talking about the branches of this vine. He's talking about abiding. The branches abiding in the vine. For he says he is the vine and we are the branches. And he says that we need to abide as branches, abide in the vine to bring fruit, the same way we need to abide in him to bring fruit. And he says, without me, just as without the vine, the branch can do nothing, the same way without him, we can do nothing. Without we abiding in him, we can do nothing. <clears throat> So, the matter here is about the divine true vine. The divine true vine. Because, you know, you can just be a branch of any vine. And you can be any branch of any vine. Uh, but when you don't know what is the true vine and you go and abide in the bush vine. You don't know what is the true vine and you go and abide in the in the sterile bush vine, the wild vine that is not of any good use, as bitter and is not sweet, that is fruitless, that is sterile, does not bear fruit. If you do that, you are wasting your time. So the important thing is, he says, he says I am the vine that you need to talk about. You have to talk about a branch of him, the vine. 
He didn't say, well, you know, there are vines, you know, and you can abide in any vine and bear any fruit. No, he said, I am the vine, and without me, you can do nothing. So it's very important. The matter here is about who is the true divine vine. That is the first question. And he now talks about the branches. Who are the truly or divinely redeemed branches? That is very important. If you don't get this, then you will take the I to be any, me to be many. Uh, no, no, no. The I is one particular person. The me is singular. There is no other way given under heaven any man can do something if it is not Christ. Any some, anything you do is nothing. If you do anything without Christ, you are busy doing nothing because in eternity... It has no value. In fact, it doesn't even have an existence. It has no reckoning in eternity. Every temporality that has no eternity in it is nothing. And so believers are already redeemed branches from what he's saying. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Believers in Christ are already redeemed branches. But they need to abide. They have already become branches, but they need to abide. And there are also others who are yet to become branches and not even, you know, to talk about abiding. That the issue of abiding is not yet a matter. The, the first thing is to become a branch. And when you become a branch, then we can talk about abiding as the branch. Now, if you are not a branch, you can do nothing that could be called fruit in the reckoning of God's eternal vineyard. If you are not yet a branch, you are, your case is even worse. And you need to do something about that. Don't stay there without being a branch to Jesus. It's of no use. Jesus said, what shall he profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you are not yet a branch, please do something about it. So that as we are talking about abiding, aha, then we are talking about how to remain a branch, not really how to become a branch. So when you don't abide in Christ, all that you ever do, he calls it nothing. He says all that you can do is nothing. All that you can do is nothing. It's only what he does through you that is something. Say, so only what is done while abiding in Christ amounts to anything of divine value for eternity. Anything done without abiding in Christ amounts to nothing. It has no value. In fact, St. Paul says that if you don't build upon the foundation and, you know, with precious stone that will endure, he said, fire will burn it. If you build with stubble, wood and hay, fire, it cannot stand the test of fire. It will be burnt off. So there's no need using stubble, wood and hay to build on a foundation that is not even the real foundation. And even when you're on the foundation, you don't build with chaff. So first thing is to know where the foundation is. Then when you go there, you build in with things that abide in a way that what you build will stand the test of fire and if you don't do that then you are wasting time and our prayer is that 
all of us that are part of this moment of sharing in the word of God, we will do something about what Jesus is saying here. To abide in Christ refers to a covenant bond to Christ. Covenant bond to Christ. That is what it is to abide in Christ. Maintain the covenant bond to Christ. And you have to maintain this covenant bond according to the gospel provisions, according to the pattern of the gospel of Christ, the pattern and provision of his new covenant. Many a time, you know, many forget that the Christian faith is not just about, you know, personal, you know, expression of intention. You know, when we say, I believe, we just think, well, it is just about our expression or declaration of our intention and decision and all that. No, it is, it's not just what you are talking. You, I believe means I enter into the new covenant bond with Christ according to the terms and pattern of that covenant. That's what it means. It's not, you don't believe the way you like. No, you believe the way you ought, not the way you want. If it's the way you want, then you are divine, you are your branch, you are your fruit. You just do it as you like it. But if you want to, to, to do it as the vine will take it, then it has to be according to the provisions and patterns of the new covenant which Christ has shed his blood to validate. If you don't do that, then you are your vine, you are your branch, and so many people now have cultural vines and branches. You say, well, you know, our Christianity is American Christianity. Our Christianity is African Christianity. Our Christianity is European Christianity. No, Christianity does not, there are no different vines. There's one vine. And you must abide in that vine, whether you are European, American, African or Chinese, Asian or whatever. It's not important. Who you are, your culture must vanish. As long as you're a cultural Christian, forget it. You are not a scriptural Christian. You are doing your thing, your vine, your branch, the way you want it. But you are not bonded to the vine. And this is important because many a time we think that Christianity is just what we make it to be. You, it's not your covenant. You are not the author. You are not the finisher. You are not the mediator. You are not the testator. You are not the advocate. So your choices are simply totally irrelevant. If you, you say you must die to yourself, you must, those are your preferences and choices, you just have to throw them away. Those trends and tendencies, you see, no, Christianity is not for trending. No, Christianity is truth. And truth is divine truth, not cultural truth, not your truth, not human truth. Divine truth revealed by the mouth of the prophets and the apostles and by the mouth of Jesus Christ as testified to by the apostles and the prophets. Anything other than that is your own. You can have your take, but you must remember your take is not the truth. You, must, you may have your tendency, remember your tendency is not the truth. You can have your tradition, your tradition is not the truth. You can have the trend, you know, the trend that is, you know, pressurizing you. But remember, the trend is not the truth. The truth is only that which the scriptures have said that is the truth. Praise the Lord. And so many don't ever forget that the Christian faith is about a blood covenant bond with Christ. The new covenant is a blood covenant. It is not just a, you know, a free-for-all, libertine, liberal, or even conservative covenant. It, does, it doesn't, it just stands on Christ's covenant. Neither liberal nor conservative. Christ
Christ's covenant. And so when one says, I believe in Christ, we must remember it's not just a verbal expression of intention and decision. And it's not just, uh, you know, saying what you like and just say, ah, I have peace. No, that's not the thing. It's entering into a blood divine covenant that God has established in Christ Jesus. If that's not what you mean by I believe, then you don't believe. It has to be that or nothing else. And as you enter into this divine covenant bond, it, the provision of this covenant is that it provides redemption from the pollution of sin in your life. It provides redemption from the penalty of sin in your life. It provides redemption from the power of sin over your life. It provides redemption from the presence of sin as you continue to abide and encounter this sinful world. It gives you redemption over this presence because the power that grace brings, the power that the Holy Spirit comes with, is not only a power to witness, but a power to wrestle. A power to race and a power to win. That is what the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit shall come upon you, you shall receive power. And he said the Spirit is the Spirit of grace. And grace is that quickening power, that enabling power, that you are able to withstand all the powers of the enemy. And nothing by any means has the capacity to hurt you. So the basic need of abiding is having the truth vine for which to abide. If there's no truth vine, there's, even if you abide from now until thy kingdom come, there's nothing to abide in. And the abiding is in vain. So having the truth vine in which we should abide is the first and basic necessity. And God has provided that. You didn't provide the vine. God has already accomplished this vine for us in Christ Jesus. And Jesus has made it known, made himself known to us. And Christ is that true vine. And the true vine has a way of bonding and abiding. And he has provided for that in Christ's new covenant. And this new covenant has been sealed by the blood of Jesus. It cannot be altered. It cannot be revised. It is not open for change. It changes everything and nothing by any means changes it. It's only open for something to be changed. But not for something to change it. No, if you change and let the New Testament change you. It's already sealed with the blood of Jesus. And once a testament is sealed by the blood of the testator, it is immutable. It is not revis revisable. It is not alterable. And so Jesus has accomplished that already. There is a steady, stable, assured vine that does not change, but can change everything. And the blood of Jesus that has sealed, what is it that the blood of Jesus sealed that are no longer reversible or, you know, alterable? It is what Jesus laid down. You know, before a covenant comes into effect, you lay down the precepts, the principles, the conditions, the provisions, the promises, the everything, the doctrine, the teaching, and all the things, the statutes, ordinances of that covenant, you spell it out. And then when you finish spelling it out as a testator, then you come with blood, seal it. And once blood is used to seal a covenant, it becomes immutable. And so when Jesus came, he took up the human flesh in his incarnation. And he was born 
at his birth. He lived. Now all these are the terms, precepts, you know, patterns for the covenant. And he lived a life from his conception, his birth, and his life. He left us a lot of foundation upon which we are to hook onto as the branch. He did work. The Bible says he went about doing good and healing all manner of diseases. He gave a lot of teachings and laid down the principles of the kingdom, the principles of the covenant, the promises of the covenant. He, he did not just leave us to observe what he did and how he lived. He gave us a verbal explanation of the meaning of his you know, uh, actual work. So there is word that explains the works. It's not, you are not left to interpret it as you think. No. And that's beautiful. Because if we are just left with the figuratives to now bring in the specifics, we will have problem. But he did the figures and then bring the meanings through the word. And there were promises and everything. Then he eventually died and his blood sealed everything. And he said, it is finished. Now, when it's finished, it's finished. It's, it's irreversible. It's settled forever. There's nothing you can do about it. And so when you are coming, you must come with this understanding. I'm not coming here to modify. There's, it is immodifiable. It cannot undergo metamorphosis. It cannot. There's nothing you can do about it. It is you that must metamorphose. It is you that must modify. It's you that must change. It's you that must. Otherwise, you are not a branch. And you are not ready to abide. Because humanity is used to changing things about humanity. And in fact, we believe in change. In fact, the only thing about humanity that is constant is change. And so we have a change mind. We pride in change. And we think that we can change God, change his covenant, change. No. God's covenant changes us. We are the ones that change. You say, I am the Lord, I change not. You say, my word is settled forever. He said, in fact, my word must come to pass as it's written. Not even one jot will miss. If it, if it will not come to pass, heaven and earth will have to not just change, but vanish. If God's word cannot be finished, heaven and earth will vanish. You will vanish. If you don't want to vanish, you let the word be finished in your life. And so change is only for us, not for God and his word. Praise the Lord. And we thank God that the Lord is making these things known to us. Also, through Christ, God has, through Christ's resurrection, you know, by resurrecting Christ, God has proved that the death of Christ and the covenant is sealed is true. And not just that it's true, it's the ultimate. There's nothing like it. Until we have another person who will incarnate as Christ incarnate, died as he died, and resurrect as he resurrected, then we don't have to have any confusion. You know, when there are many similarities, then you start having confusion. Which one is which? Now, in this one, nothing is similar. There is no other alternative. So there's nothing to confuse you about. In that way, he made it so plain. So, well, this is the only one that broke the power of death, and has the power of eternal life. And I want to break the power of death. I want to have eternal life. And that's the only thing that is divine. The ultimate power of divinity is power over death and power for eternity. And so you, don't, you are not confused. There's no competition. There's no confusion. God has laid this foundation for us. So the vine is very clear, and all we need is to bond to it through faith in Christ. So Christ's resurrection, Christ's ascension, 
They have proved that Christ is the undisputed Son of God. In Romans chapter 1 verse 4, you see, he was declared, he was manifested, he was made known to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And Jesus said, the sign I'll give you for you to know that I'm the Son of God is that I will rise after three days. Praise the Lord. The Bible said that God has given us one Son of God, one mediator, one Savior for all humanity. And that is Jesus Christ. That's the vine. And we must latch onto that vine. The aspect that's really left for us is not to have the vine. The vine is already there waiting. What is left for us is very simple. Just the hearing of faith. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 2, St. Paul was telling Galatians, why are you come? This thing, your part is simple. God has already finished the main thing. Your part is very simple. Why are you again getting confused and as if there are alternatives or comparatives? You know, this, Christianity is not a comparative faith because there is nothing to compare. Nothing. Nothing to compare. Nothing to compare. There's no faith that has eternity. No faith that has power over death. No faith, that is, it doesn't exist. No faith that has incarnation. There's, there's, there's nothing like that. So it's good to compare other faiths. But Christian faith is for you to be convinced by the Christian faith. Because it gives you, it offers you eternal redemption, eternal salvation. Others just give you a way of, you know, managing this life. But this one is giving you a way of entering into the next life. Praise the Lord. And so St. Paul says, This only would I learn of you, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. You know, in the law, for you to receive anything, you have to get sacrifices and bring, and then the Levites and the priests will do ritual works on you, sprinkling things on you before a blessing comes on you. Those ritual works of the law, they are ways of ministration that don't bring the Holy Spirit. No amount of ritual works of the law in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the sanctuary or whatever, whatever they do there, it cannot bring the Spirit on you. And St. Paul says, is it not the hearing of faith? That you got the spirit by. Are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit. Are you now made perfect. By flesh. Human works. Instead of divine manifestation. You want you know. Human celebrations. And verse 4 say. Have you suffered so many things in vain? You've suffered so many things because of this. And you want to abandon all those sufferings and go back to something that nobody even suffers for. He, and then he goes on. He that therefore ministered to you the Spirit, just as I have done, and just as Christ has done, I just ministered the Word, you had it and believed it, and Jesus brought the Holy Ghost upon you. He that ministers miracles, we just say a word, you believe it, and Jesus will bring miracle into your life. Does he do it through the rituals of the, of the, of the law? You know, many a time when people hear works of the law, they, they think it's works of righteousness. No, works of righteousness is a different matter. But works of the law are the rituals, the ceremonials of the law. That when the priest does it, does it, then he knows a divine intervention is supposed to come. It's not your responsibilities of the law. No, that's not works of the law. Works of the law are the ministrations of the law, not the responsibilities for the law, but the ministrations and the administrations of the law. That is works of the law. What the law works in your life, what is used, the law is used to work for you. That's what works of the law means. And is it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And 
When you now have this faith, you hook on. But after you have faith, you must know that you have to nourish that faith. The nourishing of faith. The hearing of faith and the nourishing of faith. And we'll see that in First Timothy chapter 1, chapter 4, verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6, First Timothy 4, 6. It says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, then you shall be a good minister of Jesus, nourished up in the works of the faith. You don't just hear the word of the faith. But you study, devote time, remember it, understand it, dig into it, live by it, conduct your life. And by the good doctrine which you have attained. And it's John, 2 John verse 8 and 10 says, Look to yourself that we lose not those things which we have worked for, but we have received a full reward. Don't lose those things that you have worked for. That will tell you that works of the law is not what you do. It is what is done on you. Because in the church, we also have the works, good works that we do. So that's, it's not the one we do that's works of the law. Works of the law is the one that God does on us through the ministration of the law. And whoever goes beyond and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. So when you talk about abiding in Christ, we talk about abiding in his doctrine. He that abides in the doctrine of God, of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Have nothing to do with anything that's not divine. Just hold on to the vine and know nothing else. Hold on to the word of God, the word of Christ, and don't know any other thing. Once you know any other thing, you are nothing. But if you know only Christ, you are a fruit unto eternal life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for revealing to us that without Jesus, we are nothing. And we must latch unto him by the hearing of faith and by the nourishment of faith so that we will produce fruit unto eternal life. We ask, O oh God, that every one of your children shall experience even this truth in their lives today in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Father, we bless your name for this day. And we know, O oh God, that this day is a day of victory for every one of your servants that are partaking of this program. Lord, it's a day of victory. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.